As the dig gets deeper, the archaeologists are starting to appreciate how treacherous and unpredictable sand can be. Sand is dangerous, and what we're facing now is something that the tunnelers, when they did the Great Escape, had to face. It's the same problem on a larger scale that the tunnelers had. How do you keep all this sand with a tremendous weight above it from coming down? Disposing of the sand is easy today. It's simply dumped into trucks and taken away. The prisoners' tunnels also produce tons of sand, but they had to get rid of it without the German guards noticing. Sand from the tunnels was hoisted up the vertical shafts twice a day. Dispersal teams then took the sand away in trouser bags made from socks. They became known as penguins. Now, to be a penguin was this. You went across to where the tunnel was and filled up your uh, socks with sand. But if you had too much sand put into your sock, then you waddled and it was called being a penguin. And then, of course, the guards saw you were a penguin and said, that chap's up to no good and would search you. And therefore, the secret was that the people put in the sand and didn't put too much in. Having done that, you then walked around the camp. The prisoners were encouraged to cultivate their own little garden. And if I was a penguin, I would go up and talk to him because while he was raking over his little plot of land, I was walking around admiring his tomatoes, but he was actually, in fact, raking in the sand which I'd been given, which had been, and that little dodges like that were being used. With so much illicit activity taking place, early warning signals were devised to alert people whenever German guards approached. On Monday, the sign would be that you would start playing with your left-hand shoelace. And the following day, it would be you'd be playing with your ear as though you've got something wrong with your ear. Uh, and um, the, the third day, it might be you're overtaken with... <laughs> Over, you know, the, all quite simple, common things. They were quite surreptitious. I mean, it was done very, very cleverly. And never let us down. Never let us down. While the heavy machines dig down to the tunnel, the archaeologists excavate the top of the vertical shaft. Careful, careful, careful. Just below the surface, they've come across an intriguing metal rod. This, I think, is a significant find, very significant find, because what we've got on the slab are a couple of quite deep holes, slots, and those slots must really be to let in this slab into the side of the sump. And so this, most likely, is going to be a tool for letting in that slab, and it fits absolutely perfectly. Look at the upper side. We got an abrasion that runs up right here at the top, and it's abraded there. Yeah, as you can see, it's going to have to pull it out like that, yeah. which then is going to wear this thing back down, isn't it? Pull and it out and then like this. Some form of lifting hook was essential to haul up the concrete slab from its tight-fitting slot in the washroom sump. With practice, the prisoners became adept at closing the tunnel entrance at speed. The tunnel was only open for about 10 minutes, rather like um, when racing cars go into a pit stop and the thing stops and everyone does his job like that very, very quickly uh, and it could be done open and closed in about 10 minutes. It had to be done quickly because the Germans were wandering around, not maybe only one or two Germans, but wandering around in every hut all the time, so you had to be slick. As the preparations for the escape continued, the stakes became ever higher. How long could the prisoners keep their three tunnels safe and secret? As tunnels Tom, Dick and Harry grew in length, more and more items were needed to build things for the escape. The Germans later calculated that the prisoners had used up an astonishing number of objects for their three tunnels. 4,000 bedboards, 34 chairs, 52 tables, 90 double-tier bunk beds, and 1,600 blankets to muffle the sound of tunneling. But the single most useful escape item was the powdered milk tin sent to prisoners by the Red Cross. They were known as Klim, 
milk, spelt backwards. Over 1,400 were used. Charles Hupert was an expert in turning tins into tools. We used clem tins for everything that we made because you could cut the ends out and have a large piece of tin to work with. You can straighten that out uh, flat and make uh, uh, join them together in a lock joint such as this and take your wooden mallet and hammer them down. Then you take your back side of a knife and bear down on that with a lot of pressure on both sides of that crimp so that the tin will not separate. In order to make the tools that are used in the tunnels, the digging tools, the funnels, and the uh, uh, lamps to give light. Back at the washroom sump, the archaeologists have found a homemade object of the kind Charles Hubert used to make. Okay, what is it? It's metal. Okay. So that's a, well, there's some kind of handle. Yeah. yeah. And that's don't, don't pull around. that out. Let's let us. Does the wire go all the way around it? But look how thick the corrosion yeah. is here. All though. the way around from there. It's, it's but this, but this isn't really corroded. Let's just take that off. It's kind of flimsy for a ladle. You, I, I wouldn't think yeah, of it as you, being. Yeah, you wouldn't a, be able to shift sand with that. A, it, you know, it wouldn't. You couldn't really use it for a scoop. Is it, what's that black? Wait. Black where? One. That's got to be a lamp, isn't it? And there's a wick. With candles in short supply, the manufacturing department made lamps for the tunnels that burnt mutton fat, skimmed off the unpalatable soup served up by the camp kitchen. Then we install a wick. We usually found someone that had worn out a pair of pajamas that had cord or made out of cotton, and then we would drop that in there. But the longer the tunnels became, the less oxygen there was at the digging face. The mutton fat lamps were going out, and the tunnelers were suffocating. Walter Morrison helped to design a contraption that would feed fresh air down to the tunnels. The air pump was a fascinating device, but it needed quite an array of materials. There were two um, sides of, of beds, two ends of beds, Four ice hockey sticks, four ping pong bats, two kit bags with nine coat hooks, empty powdered milk tins. The prisoners built an incredible device that could pump air on both the forwards and backwards strokes. These photos show one of the real air pumps that were taken by German guards after the escape. Fresh air was fed to the air pump along klim tins going down the shaft. The pump then sent air along tins laid under the floor of the tunnel. Shortly after the air pump was installed, another set of prisoners revolutionized the whole process of moving sand up and down the tunnel. This was one of the most amazing pieces of engineering yet. Underground railways complete with halfway houses where the diggers could change trains. Now sand could be moved much more quickly from tunnel face to entrance. The railway would also provide a high-speed escape route on the night of the breakout. But not everything could be homemade like the railway. Some items had to be obtained more deviously. The art of bribery and corruption was well developed. I mean, it's obvious that amongst um, a few hundred or more that became um, intelligent young men, you would have people who were uh, understood every trade, profession and vocation. And we must have had one or two very experienced con men in that place. They would um, invite him in for a cup of cocoa and um, then they'd give him a large chocolate bar and, uh, and one or two other things and um, tell him to come back again if he wanted more. So he'd come back. Well then, of course, he'd be asked to um, bring in a document which we wanted, that sort of thing. And if he refused, they say, oh, don't forget you've accepted things from us now. Through these underhand means, the prisoners were starting to refine their preparations. Several months into the digging, an audacious theft transformed life underground. Two sharp-eyed prisoners stole some wire from German workmen and installed lighting in the tunnels, tapping into the camp's electricity circuit. 
Digging deeper into the sump, the archaeologists think they've found some electrical cable from the tunnel. Holy shit. What kind of uh, metal does that appear to be? It's not, is it copper? No, no, it's a tin of some kind, but it, it, hasn't, it hasn't decayed. It's, it's, it's not steel, it's not iron or steel. But is it regular? What's the sheathing like? Is it uh, a regular looking sheathing is, does not. It, it looks homemade. We dug down through the bottom of the concrete floor. Now, this is a washroom. You're not going to have electrical cable under a washroom. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. So the, the bottom line is that if we've got electrical cable here, it's either been put in after the war or it was electrical cable that was put in by the escapers. I mean, those are the only two possibilities, really. The prisoners strung bulbs along the entire lengths of Tom, Dick and Harry. From now on, traveling up the tunnels was an even more spectacular experience as the big night of the escape grew closer.